Good evening, I'm Yorita Walde and this is Making the Case. This week marks the end of one month since the start of the R. Kelly sex trafficking trial in New York. But after dozens of witnesses, more than 10 of them alleged victims, plus letters, audio and video recordings, the prosecution still hasn't wrapped its case in chief. Court was in recess today for the Jewish holiday uh, Yom Kippur, but when court does resume tomorrow, it isn't clear whether the prosecution is any closer to resting its case. Veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor Paul Henderson is, of course, here with analysis and his predictions. Um, all right, Paul, the prosecution is still presenting evidence in a trial that the judge said would be over in a month, yet here we are still getting more testimony and evidence. Um, when it comes to those jurors, though, when does it when does it become um, sort of overkill with this emotional testimony and the information too much to process? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to balance that against all of the accusations and the victims that have come out of the woodwork to testify in a case like this. And so, you know, as a prosecutor, you're always trying to balance whether or not you have a cumulative effect where jurors become insensitive to the information because they've heard that allegation already. And here we've got over a dozen victims testifying, and they each have an, almost an escalating story that increases the layers of behavior that they were involved with. And the prosecution has to really balance out whom they're going to put on the stand, what kind of narrative are they going to tell, and when that narrative becomes too repetitive, at what point does the jury stop paying attention and become either judgmental and questioning the credibility of one victim versus another, or they start getting used to this type of information and stop paying attention to it. Now, I think they planted some very key testimony throughout the witnesses that were on the stand. So at the very beginning, we heard about the STDs and herpes, and we all leaned forward and were paying attention. And then progressively, we learned about the grooming behavior where he would meet people at the McDonald's or in the recording studio, how he used his team around him to go and reach out to particularly young girls and women to get them introduced to R. Kelly and to fold into following what his rules were and the narrative and directions about how they all had to be around him and the rules they had to follow in his presence. And then they started ending with not just his abusive behavior, his recorded sexual contact with presumed minors, but also how those rules spread out amongst the people that he hired and he directed. So his personal assistants, his guards, the people around him, how they literally enforced the rules that he had that allowed him to engage in this illegal behavior. That's what prosecution has to re-remind, I think, this jury about towards the end, that all of this stuff that you're hearing is actually illegal behavior. Here's why and here's how, because that's what they need in order to get a guilty verdict. All right, so you talked about the prosecution planting key uh, testimony early on. If you had to pick a defining moment or two from the prosecution's case where you said, okay, um, they just proved their case, they can pretty much pack it up and, and go home, what would that be? Or have they yet to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt? I, I think they've proven it to me, but I, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a prosecutor, I know what they're doing. I, I think they still need to connect those dots. I think they need to explain to the jury that regardless of what you feel about these victims, regardless of what you've heard from these witnesses, let us define for you what the elements are for accountability that translates into guilt. And in that way, they need to remind people that you don't have to like these people. You don't have to agree with their behavior. You can be judgmental about their promiscuity or about their fan behavior. But if you believe more than one of them was underage when they were engaged in sexual conduct with R. Kelly, that defines the guilt and that defines the verdict of guilty. And so that's what I'm still waiting for from prosecution. And, and to be honest with you, and, and you're a prosecutor, I think you might have been looking for this as well. I'm looking and waiting for some uh, expert to come on. I want to hear from a psychologist to talk about why he was doing this kind of thing, because I think this is one of the natural things, at least, you know, I've been in front of plenty of juries, and this is what they want to know is why. 
Why does someone do things like this? Why does someone behave like this? Why does someone act like this? And I think they have to overcome the hurdle that I think uh, the defense will likely use is that he's a celebrity and that gives him permission to act inappropriately or act badly. And they have to overcome that to show that beyond his celebrity, that he is a defendant, that he was a criminal. And this was the illegal behavior that he engaged in because that's what they need the jury to believe at the conclusion of this trial. I, I've seen enough. I've seen and heard the evidence to believe that it's valid listening to the witnesses and seeing the evidence. But I, I still expect a little bit more for a lay audience and for this jury. All right, Paul, let's now turn to the uh, defense. Uh, the testimony from the prosecution's witnesses, they've been cumulative and they've all corroborated one another. Um, so, as usual, the defense clearly has an uphill battle. Um, they don't have to obviously prove a thing, right? Um, because the prosecution, of course, has the burden of proving a crime was committed, but they've got to do something to take that sting out of those damning accounts given by the prosecution's witnesses. So how do they do that? I, I think they do it in two ways. I think they do it by laying a foundation of victim blaming. I think they do it by turning a judgmental eye on promiscuity and uh, these men and women that were engaging in sexual behavior and trying to put it under the umbrella of fan behavior that they're gonna talk about them being willing participants, that they received money and trips and jobs, and that they didn't report or tell people when they could have, and we should be judgmental about that. I think that's the approach that they're likely to take. The secondary approach that I think that they're gonna run with is R. Kelly as a huge celebrity, as a musical genius, that we should accept behavior like this because this is what celebrities do, that they rant, they're illogical, they're sometimes mean, and that they should not be held accountable in a criminal court of law, which is what we're in right now for this trial. But I think that the real difficulty is in trying to obscure all of the behavior, all of the testimony, and all of the evidence against any criminal behavior. And remember, prosecution has to prove at least two instances of criminal behavior in order to get the RICO files uh, affirmed. And so that, that's what I think we're going to hear from the defense. And I don't see any other approach that they could take in a case like this. I would be very surprised if R. Kelly gets on the stand. I don't think they can put him on the stand because I think the jurors might not like him after listening to what they've heard over the past few weeks. Well, you know what? We talked about that before, whether um, R. Kelly would be taking the stand or not. Of course, we would advise against it. But do you think, quickly, Paul, um, do you think R. Kelly wants to take the stand? I think he does. I mean, we've heard from him. We're like, remember that Gail King interview? Woo! Now, that yeah. was something, Robert. I think he wants to tell his story because he thinks people will listen to him. And let's not forget that he's beaten a case before in the criminal courts. I think he feels like if he could tell his story and share his energy and his personality, that people see him as a celebrity, that that will help him. And I think not in this case, not right now, and not at this time. I think the tides have changed. I think the evidence is different. And I would not allow him to go on the stand where I am part of that defense team, which I'm not, nor would I would be. <laughs> All right, veteran prosecutor and legal contributor, Paul Henderson, thank you so much. Coming up, testimony continues on Capitol Hill as some of the country's top gymnasts testify on how the FBI mishandled abuse allegations brought against disgraced team doctor Larry Nassar. Latest developments just moments away.